Hello and good evening if you are tuning in from Europe, it is Sunday. If you are tuning in from the US on the West Coast, it is just about morning the afternoon. Welcome to Unheard. My name is Freddie Sayers and we're doing a bit of an emergency special edition of the show today uh, because the news out of the West Coast with the Silicon Valley collapse, Silicon Valley Bank collapse, is worrying. It's a very fast moving story. We had Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen coming on talking uh, earlier today on US TV about what might or might not be announced in advance of the opening tomorrow morning. Will there be a bailout? Will depositors be protected? How bad is it going to be? There is all sorts of theories floating around. And one person that we thought we should definitely hear from is someone, I'm happy to say, has been a bit of a friend of the show. This will be his third time. Um, he is none other than David Sachs, who is a big Silicon Valley figure in his own right. He is founding partner at Craft Ventures. Um, he was one of the original PayPal uh, group, and he is a co-host of the All In podcast, and he joins now from the Bay Area. Hi, David. Hey, good to be with you, Freddie. Very exciting Well, to be live. Indeed, <laughs> and I'm, I'm happy to be live because the yeah. story's moving so fast, I don't know where we're going to be in three hours, let alone by tomorrow. What is That's your current sure. read, given what we heard from the Treasury Secretary, given all of these rumors swirling around. I mean, even you heard uh, the idea that your friend Elon Musk might come to the rescue. Uh, what do you think the most likely outcome is looking where you are now? Well, it's, it's really hard to know. I mean, you're right that we're going to know a lot more by tonight. The best case scenario would be that a buyer would step in for Silicon Valley Bank, uh, perhaps backstopped by the Fed or by the FDIC, and they would basically announce that all deposits are safe and that the bank will reopen on Monday and people can get their money out that, if they want to. That why, would be the best case scenario, and why which is basically why this would be a kind of philanthropic gesture or they think there's it's potentially a, an opportunity. Well, I mean, I think Silicon Valley Bank was a, a viable and lucrative bank that was worth, what, like $20 billion just a few weeks ago until they made, you know, a couple of stupid investment decisions. So it has a lot of strong relationships. I think that there's a lot. Uh, it's a community bank that serves Silicon Valley. There's a lot of goodwill towards it in the community. I think it is a viable franchise. Uh, moreover, I, uh, I've seen multiple analyses kind of floating around, and the belief is that um, – if there is much of a gap between their assets and liabilities, it's not a big one. I think that a lot of people expect the depositors of SVB to eventually uh, be made whole or get, you know, 80, 85, 90 cents on the dollar. So it's not like a 50 cents on the dollar hmm. type situation. So I think the best case scenario here is, you know, you get what happened with WAMU or, you know, Bear Stearns, the, the, the feds basically place the bank with call it you know JP Morgan or top four bank, um, I think that's what should have happened last week uh, when SVB was buckling. Uh, I think the Feds could have been much more aggressive and they could have nipped this problem in the bud. Uh, they didn't do it, and now I think the situation is we have to be concerned not just about SVB, but I already know of at least one other bank. I don't want to say the name, but the runs have already started. So this is now wow. we're now so in the this early. Is, this is a regional bank or a smaller. Bank in yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's a regional bank, and and then there's a list of other ones. You can kind of look and see which regional banks their stocks were down 20% on Thursday and Friday, because uh, the market was starting to question whether the SVB problem would would spread. So when you say and, the run has already started, is that mm -hmm. just images of people queuing up outside cash machines, or is it actually some sort of information that you have that people are withdrawing in large quantities their online savings? Um, both. Uh, the, the thing to understand, this is not. Um, this is more of like a business banking phenomenon. I think this is less about the consumer side. Uh, and the, the specific issue with business banking is that the two hundred fifty thousand dollar FDIC insurance limit isn't really adequate for a business account. So, if you think about the situation we had a hundred years ago in the U.S. before FDIC came along, is that every decade we would have panics. We would have runs on the bank all the time. It was a it was a frequent problem. All it would really take to get started is a rumor that a bank was having problems and people would go race to get their money out. It would become a self-fulfilling prophecy. This type of thing roiled the American economy, uh, again, for decades until you know it eventually led to um, a, a bank collapse. And in 1933, 
they implemented FDIC and it was $100,000 and they raised it to two hundred and fifty, and that sort of solved the problem because if you know the federal government is backstopping your deposits, you can ignore when there's you know news or rumors to the effect that you know this bank isn't safe. Well, we don't have that with business banking. You know, to, like I said, two hundred and fifty is just not enough of an amount. So if you're a business who banks at a bank and you have reason to believe that it might be insecure. You're going to race to take your money out. I mean, you got to think about the game theory here, which is that if it turns out to not be true and the bank is fine, you can just move your money back there in a couple of weeks, right? It's not there's no penalty for just transferring all your money out. But if you're right, or if the the rumor is right, and you take your money out, you might save 100% of it. So mm. this is why panics happen. I mean, the the word panic doesn't really adequately explain why it's rational in the game theory for people to race to take their money out of banks. And this is why, at the end of the day, you need the Fed to backstop the banking system, to guarantee confidence, to let depositors know their money is safe, is because confidence undergirds the whole banking system. I mean, and and this, is, this is why, you know, I think people who say, well, David, you're a staunch libertarian, you know, why are you supporting this government action? Listen, I've always believed that a core responsibility of the federal government is to make sure the banking system is safe. I know what happened in American history when we didn't have FDIC. Hmm. So that is the situation we're effectively in right now as we are in the early stages of a good old fashioned panic uh, on so business banks because you, you FDIC stole, is not adequate. You stole my follow up question there, David. <laughs> <laughs> but let, let's just ask about, the, there's a lot in what you just said. So. Your assessment is that the fundamentals of Silicon Valley Bank were fine, and actually they weren't unusually risky in their investment decisions. I mean, they made some bad bets, but I mean, you're a Silicon Valley guy. How much should we be seeing this as you sort of defending your, your team and your, your community, or how much is it a, a, just an assessment of the numbers? I mean, is it, yeah. is it cause most people will read, you know, they'll, they'll read the, the story kind of quite superficially, it will be called Silicon Valley Bank, and everyone will presume that something about the bank was risky, Silicon Valley-ish, and therefore right. they got their comeuppance. You don't think that's true? Yes. Well, OK, so let's talk about what Silicon Valley Bank did wrong. They definitely did a bunch of things wrong, obviously, to create this situation. Um, what happened is, over the last couple of years, their deposits grew enormously. I think they roughly tripled over the last couple of years, partly because we were in this super frothy stage of the economy. I think their assets grew from roughly 60 to 70 billion, something like 200 billion. Right. Um, they deployed, I think, about 80 billion of those assets in a security they thought was pretty safe, which was mortgage-backed securities, okay? They also had a venture loan business uh, that I never approved of. I always thought it was a bad idea. I said so on my pod months ago, but that was only something like 9% of their portfolio. It's not the reason for this crisis. It's actually because they invested in mortgage-backed securities, things that they thought were safe. A year ago, these securities were paying 1.5%. Then we had the most unprecedented run, the fastest run of rate hikes in history, where the Fed funds rate went from basically zero to roughly 4.5%, and it destroyed the value of those mortgage-backed securities. Hmm. Now, there's a weird regulatory nuance to this, which is that if Silicon Valley Bank could hold those 10-year bonds to maturity, it wouldn't have to recognize a loss. It would just have that its principal back. And so on its books, it didn't have to recognize this loss. However, and that's true for, for all these banks, and, and I personally don't think it makes any sense, but what they're hoping to do is not recognize the loss. And what's happened over the last year is that because of the, let's call it the downturn in the, the economy, the, their balance, the, their, the deposits at SVB have been shrinking. So startups been taking their money out, they've been burning money, right. but the, the amount of new investments has not increased, funds haven't been raising as much money. So what happened is there was a drawdown of deposits and it became clear they were gonna need to sell uh, those bonds in order to basically to you know, meet their- they had hoped. Exactly. Hmm. And then it became clear that they, they needed to, and I think that would have created um, a reduction in the amount of regulatory capital on their balance sheet. So then they announced that they were going to basically do a stock offering. And that's that basically happened last week. I think that was poorly handled. But that is what caused the run on the bank, is everybody said, wait a second, maybe this bank is not safe. Hmm. And that that's basically what triggered the, the run on the bank. Now, now, you asked, at the end of the day, is this bank going to be safe? No, this bank is questionable. Questionable. 
I don't know whether depositors are going to get 100 cents on the dollar, 90 cents or 85, 95, whatever. The point is, though, that if a bank is merely questionable, you would take your money out. I mean, if you have uninsured deposits there and a bank is questionable, you get out right. because it doesn't cost you anything to get out, but it might save all your money. So there are, there are 5,000 odd banks in the US. This is apparently, by some measure, the 18th largest bank. Obviously, smaller regional banks, any banks that don't feel like they are too big to fail, suddenly feel vulnerable at this point. If this could happen to Silicon Valley Bank and they weren't doing, maybe they were a bit sloppy, maybe they should have done better, but they were doing the kinds of things that many small banks do, Right. And the, the follow-up question is, which other institutions are vulnerable and how big could the contagion get? Right. Well, so, so let's start with last week, the head of the FDIC testified that as of the end of 2022, there was $620 billion of unrealized losses in those sort of long-dated bonds that I talked about. Okay, just actually in treasuries, I believe. So, you know, you can lo you lose money if you're marking to market on a bond, especially a long dated bond, if interest rates go up and the prices move inverse to, to um, interest rates. So there's currently, this is the FDIC just testified a week ago that we have 620 billion of unrealized losses in banks. I don't know which banks have those losses. Do you? How are we supposed to figure that out? I mean, like even Bill Ackman, who's a very sophisticated investor, says he can't figure out the balance sheet of these banks and which ones are safe and which ones are not. Mm -hmm. So we have a confidence problem now. And I think that what we need the Fed to do is tell us that these banks are safe. That's the only thing that's going to do. And, um, and and so this is why I think the, the contagion will spread is without that confidence, without depositors knowing they're safe, that anytime there's even a flutter of concern about a bank, you're going to want to get out. It's going to look like the 1800s again. The trouble is, and you mentioned the politics of this, and obviously it's it's a political question, that we've we've had the experience of 2008, where supposedly all of these rules change rule changes came in to make sure that the little guy, the ordinary taxpayer, wasn't once again bailing out risky financiers, right. and it's just a tough sell in the yeah, I, current political climate, that Silicon Valley Bank, with that name of all names, <laughs> with people like yourself and many others who are making you know, lucrative investments in these things, should be underwritten by the taxpayer. Okay, so, so let's go back to 2008. So I think the thing that was offensive about 2008 is you had a bailout of the stockholders and sometimes bondholders of these institutions that were poorly managed. Nobody, as far as I know, is advocating for a bailout of SVB. OK, their stockholders are going to get wiped out. Their bondholders are going to get wiped out. Their executive stock options are going to get wiped out. That is all right and good. What we're talking about here are the deposits. And are you really going to say that somebody should lose all of their money because they put their money in this bank? How was that a moral hazard problem? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that individual depositors, even small businesses, are in a good position to assess the creditworthiness of the balance sheet of your typical bank, especially a top 16 bank that was Moody's A-rated last week mm. that had a regulatory seal of approval. As far as we know, SVB wasn't in violation of any regulatory rules that had the seal of approval. The government basically said this bank is fine. So you put your money there and all of a sudden you can lose your deposits. So that's what we're really talking about is are we gonna basically say that depositors and it's not just about SVB. You have to think about it as a systemic problem. Are we basically going to say that deposits in the U.S. banking system are no longer safe? Because I think that's what we're talking about. And I think the problem is even more pernicious than that. Because Can as I, a result, just before, yeah. to, just to to question that point. I mean, you talked about game theory. If the U.S. government guarantees all deposits from all depositors, including businesses, in all of the 5,000 banks in the U.S then that radically changes the moral hazard, doesn't it? Because then everyone knows that every deposit is safe. So if you're a bank and you're at the other end of the equation, you know that you're not risking people's lives anymore. You're not risking right. collapse. And it's going to encourage back to pre-2008 kind of risk-taking again, isn't right. it? Right. Well, look, I think, I think there's a couple of issues. One is um, I, I personally don't think that depositors are in the best position to assess 
the creditworthiness of a bank. That is what we rely on the Fed to do. They need to basically be involved in that. If Bill Ackman can't figure it out, how is your typical small business going to figure it out? So I think that that's point number one. And, um, and I think that, um, you know, I think the solution here is that, again, I just think $250,000 is just insufficient for a business bank. Well, I think what we need is some sort of like FDIC business class product that goes up to 10 million, 25 million. And in exchange for getting that, being able to offer that product, that business bank would have to meet much tougher requirements. So I think the way this should work is, you know, you should be able to put your money in a fully insured deposit account up to a much greater amount. And in exchange, the bank just can't put that investment and maybe anything but highly marketable liquid securities mm. uh, that are marked to market daily. That's probably the, the way, some version of that, I think, is the right way to go. Well, but What about but listen, requiring if you, if people you, if, to insure if, their deposits? Maybe there's a whole new insurance business that needs to be brought into being here. I mean, maybe it's, I think, maybe it's I, irresponsible to put your deposits in a bank without having knowing that they're insured. Maybe you should, but but there's no insur there's no private insurer who's big enough to basically back up the U.S. banking system because you're talking about systemic risk. You get a run of bank failures. No one's big enough to do that except the Fed. You have to have the Fed backstop ultimately the confidence of the banking system. So listen, these are all nice theoretical considerations of how we could set up a better system. The point right now is that we're in the early stages of, I think, what is like a banking crisis and what could be sort of a cascading panic. And, you know, like Larry Summers said, this is not the time to have lectures on moral hazard. You know, we can certainly figure that out. But look, you know, one of the other things I've said is blaming the depositors here in this situation is kind of like blaming the patient in a medical malpractice situation because they didn't do a good enough job shopping for a doctor. Mm. It's like you, the patient, you should have done a better job. You should have chosen a better doctor. Um, mm. We yeah. don't, we don't, we don't put that burden on the patient because the patient doesn't know. I don't think your average small business is in a position. If Bill Ackman's not in a position to figure out the balance sheet of these banks, how in the world is your typical small up. business? And, and by the way, the only reason people are being stubborn about this point is because Silicon Valley Bank has the name Silicon Valley in the name. If this was Farmers Bank, okay, and it was 40,000 farms, small business farms that were on the hook, everybody would understand. The arguments being made would be, we can't let 40,000 farms go out of business. They didn't do anything wrong. They just trusted when they put their money in a bank that it was safe. They didn't understand themselves to be making an unsecured loan to that bank. Are you kidding? They didn't engage in a, an investment activity. They just right. wanted a checking account. Okay, you know? Let's, if we return to the kind of prognostication business for a second, what is your read on what Janet Yellen said? What do you think the most likely outcome is by tomorrow morning? Do you think what you've asked for will happen? Well, uh, it's, it's really unclear what's going to happen tonight. I saw her appearance on Meet the Press this morning. I think it was inadequate. Um, it was the sentiments were sort of right. What she basically she basically said three things, which I think are are basically good pillars of something to build on. Uh, point number one was we're not going to bail out the stockholders and bondholders of SVB. Okay, very good. We all agree on that. Point number two, we're going to meet the needs of depositors. Okay, that's right. But what exactly does meet the needs mean? They're either safe or they're not. Deposits in the U.S. banking system, specifically the regional banking system, are either safe or they're not. Tell us which one it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then point number three. Did she mean she, all depositors there? Any type of business as well as. She just said we're going to meet the needs of depositors. So they're going to look out for depositors, but we don't really know what that means. My point is that that instinct is correct, but be clear about what you're going to do. Stop being vague. Um, and then point number three is we're going to prevent contagion. We're going to you know, sort of protect the banking system. But she said it in these like wishy-washy terms that didn't reflect the urgency. I think the statement that's needed is – we are going to do whatever it takes to protect the U.S. banking system. Regional banks in the U.S. are safe. We will stand behind depositors. We will make sure that you do not lose your money. Anything short of that, this crisis will continue. We will have, we will have uh, more banks, I think, starting on Monday, where people are going to take a shot at, at you know, a run on the banks. So, I, look, I could be wrong about that, but this is just what I believe is going to happen. A lot of smart people think is going to happen. So, you and then you got you to you gotta, you gotta also think... This, this, Freddie, you got to think also about upside downside here. Okay, if I'm wrong, and you know 
somehow we're all being overly panicky and there's not going to be a run on the banks. Don't worry about it. It's just not going to cost very much to guarantee this situation because the losses will stop at SVB and there's not a big delta there, if any. Okay. And that is why th this should have been done on Friday. But mm -hmm. if I'm right and there, and these sort of what I would call half measures are inadequate, we will have a rolling, uh, we will have a, basically a banking crisis. We will have a rolling situation and then it gets more and more expensive to solve at every stage because more and more banks are going to have this problem. Mm -hmm. I already know of at least one other bank that has this problem. So, mm -hmm. Uh, is the does the phrase whatever it takes not kind of spook you a little bit? Because in other contexts we've heard it about Ukraine, we heard it about the, the pandemic. We hear it's it's quite a fashionable phrase actually for governments to take. We're gonna we're gonna do whatever it takes to secure X, Y, or Z huge goal. In this case, it's guaranteeing every single bank in the U.S. A lot of people will hear that and think this is yet more sort of socializing of risk, basically. Right. If and and you say it wouldn't cost very much, just to, to fix this problem, but the principle would then be that every bank is basically guaranteed by the government. It's a it's yet another huge undertaking which seems to move power away from a normal risk reward private sector towards government guarantees. Okay, so first of all, the the whatever it takes with respect to Ukraine, and you know I'm against that because I we don't have a vital American interest in Ukraine. I've said that. In fact, we're basically potentially flirting with World War III over there. Right. We do have a vital American interest in protecting the banking system and preventing runs on the bank, ensuring the confidence of deposits in our banking system. I can think of no better so thing for the United States government to focus on than that. And I personally think it's absurd that what we're talking about here is bailing out pensioners in Ukraine and bailing out college loans that, as far as we know, were payable, but we're not going to basically protect. We're not talking about bailing out the stockholders or bondholders, we're talking about protecting deposits in the regional banking system. Let me tell you what the logical consequence of this is, Freddie. So because of 2008, the government has basically said there's a handful of the biggest banks, which are what, what are called systemically important banks. They're the banks that are too big to fail. Okay. There's four. If right? you, there's four, yeah. And they're in the trillion dollar club. They got over a trillion dollars of assets. Hmm. The government basically is now saying, it, it, whether the Fed knows it or not, whether Janet Yellen knows it or not, what she is saying is this. There are two tiers of banks in the U.S. There are the systemically important ones. They're too big to fail. If you put your money in that bank, it is a true deposit. You will not lose it in a bank failure. The second tier is everyone else. And if you're in that tier, you don't have a true deposit. It's not guaranteed. You know what you're doing? You're making an unsecured loan to that bank. Okay, now I ask you. Who would ever put their money in a tier two? Who would ever put their money? Who wants to make a loan? I just want a checking account. You're telling me that my checking account is a loan to that bank? Are you kidding me? So what, How does that make sense? You're, you're almost making a kind of populist argument, I guess, which is that far from this being bailing out millionaires, you think the, the effect of, of a guarantee like you're talking about would stop it all going to the big guys and wiping out all of the little guys. Absolutely, absolutely. What's, what, what is in process here, unlike 2008, which basically was a failure at the top, this is basically a bottom-up failure where it's gonna be the regional banks and the community banks that are under massive pressure. And I think that is where the failures will happen. And the big four banks are just gonna gobble up all these deposits. And maybe that's why there is this indifference is because the, the big four banks are the politically connected ones. They're the ones who have clout in Washington. It's the people without political power here who aren't going to get, you know, I don't want to even use the word bailed out, but who aren't going to get their deposits protected. So, um, yeah, I think that is the logical consequence here is that there will be a massive consolidation and centralization of the banking system in these semi-nationalized banks. Um, so in order to avoid that, you want more, bigger, better, stronger statements just basically a guarantee, 100%, 90%, some sort of high figure guaranteed that if you put your money in any bank, you're not going to lose it. If that doesn't happen, or not to your standards by tomorrow morning, paint the scenario of how it could go wrong. I mean, what, what should we be worried about? What is the, the worst case scenario here? The worst case scenario is basically we start having a run of bank failures like we did in the 1800s all the time because people realized that their money wasn't guaranteed. So, um, and I think the thing you have to understand is that about the sort of intervention is that the longer you wait, the harder it becomes and the more expensive it becomes. 
if the regulators had acted last week and simply basically shored up SVB, said, listen, we're going to backstop your bond portfolio, okay? We're going to provide you the liquidity you need, or had placed SVB with a top bank and basically organized a WAMU or a Bear Stearns type situation, this thing wouldn't have costed the government anything. Mm. By the way, the, the FDIC, they raise their own money through premiums on banks. So the FDIC could come out and say, okay, we have to use some money to basically solve this SVB problem. We think that you know we need to raise premiums on regional banks or whatever. So this idea that like it's going to cost you know Joe Blow the taxpayer money that didn't have to be the case at all. So that's what they could have done last week. By Friday, when SVB was placed in receivership, they could have said, okay, all deposits will be whole, and that would have immediately stopped the run on the next set of banks. Now we're in what Sunday. All they've said on Sunday morning is no bailout. Apparently, there's a report that Biden himself is saying no bailout. So they are cratering confidence right now. They have not announced a plan. And if on if this next week we see more runs on the bank, then you're now going to have to save that number of banks. And then the complaints will be even louder because, well, how can we spend that amount of money? Those, those depositors at those banks, they should have known better. They made a risky decision. They should have to suffer the consequences. Uh, and it's going to get more expensive. So I believe it's only a matter of time before the government has to intervene, has to step in. And the sooner you do it, the easier and cheaper it's going to be. We're live. We've got some people commenting and some questions coming in. And one of the themes you'll be unsurprised to hear is, a, is some of this question about VC companies. Uh, you yourself are in VC. SVP's depositors are mostly just VC's portfolio companies, says one commenter. He wants you to bail out risky startups, which is just bailing out the VC's investment. That is going to be the pushback question yeah. that you get, particularly because no doubt you have yourself some investments in some of these startups that will suffer right. greatly if, if their, their deposits are lost. So Listen, what's your yes. response to that? In my response to that is that SVB has 40,000 small business customers, okay? And there is a, a tech bent to them, but these companies have real employees, they have real customers, and both of those people are all over the country. We have, for example, we have a company that employs thousands of nurses. I mean, there and there are some tweets out there by CEOs of companies of people who live in the Midwest saying, "Listen, I'm, you know, I I'm the CEO of a 10-person startup. I drive a Hyundai. Um, you know, we have our banking at SVB. We're trapped. We can't make payroll. Something like 10,000 of the 40,000 companies are in danger of not making uh, payroll on Wednesday." because the Fed hasn't provided clarity on what's going to happen. And, and by the way, I actually think that from the point of view of, of uh, the tech ecosystem, the most important thing here is, is maybe not even to say that you're going to get 100 cents on the dollar. It's just to provide speed and clarity. I mean, if the Fed came out tonight and said, listen, we've looked at the books, and um, everyone's going to get 85 cents on the dollar, and you're going to have that money on Monday, that would actually solve the problem for the tech community. I mean, it would be a little bit of a haircut, but people can move. They would people can move on. It would be fine. I think you'd still have the systemic risk of now people understand that deposits are no longer safe in the U.S. So that's the, that's a separate problem. From the point of view of just the tech community, what we need is speed and certainty and availability to funds. I don't understand how anyone, anyone could be against that, even if you, um, I think, are misguided in thinking mm. that you don't want to protect depositors. But just to finish the point, so but let me go back to this idea that these companies were engaged in something risky. Okay. Yes, startups are risky, but were they engaged in any risky behavior? All they did was open a bank account. They're doing the same thing that every small business all over the country does. So, you know, again, this idea that like they weren't making an investment. No, no, none of these 40,000 startups are asking to be bailed out of some crazy risky investment they made or some bad business decision. These are solvent companies. Hmm. These are companies who may go under because they can't get their money out of the bank. And you want to say, oh, they should die. They're a startup. I guess, like well, I said, if they were farmers, you would have no trouble in seeing how ridiculous and unfair that would be. Well, and by the way, this is going to blow back on all those people who say, Freddie, let them die. Just wait till this bank run reaches your town right. because that is what's next. So I guess what they would say is there are 5,000 banks in the U.S. There's only one right now that is in this situation. Is it just a coincidence that it's Silicon Valley Bank? Could equally well have been any other? Or is the culture of Silicon Valley, which is awash with money, kind of confident and happy with 
what other people would consider risks that normal people wouldn't want to take, has that infected the institution in some way? You know, there are tweets I've seen of people saying that Silicon Valley Bank is like a community. If you want someone to pay for your lunch or pay for the, some kind of drinks party you're having with startup -y people, Silicon Valley Bank is always there to foot the bill. Um, we've seen tweets from, um, I think there was one from a, a risk officer from Silicon Valley Bank here in the UK that would looked very much obsessed with the latest kind of diversity, equity, inclusion narrative and didn't seem to be focusing on her job, which is to manage risk. This, this is becoming the narrative, which is yeah. that in some way, of course it was Silicon Valley Bank because they took their eyes off the what really mattered and they were just being reckless. Are you sure that there isn't some truth in that? Um, with all due respect, it, Freddie, it's faux populist bullshit. Um, listen, that sort of woke uh, diversity officer is part of SVB, SVB UK. It's not even part of the US branch. I understand the critique, and maybe SVB was focused on the wrong things. But let's get very specific about why SVB went, went under here, okay? It's not because they were throwing too many parties. It is because they bought mortgage-backed securities, which probably every bank Every regional bank, certainly every top 20 regional bank, has a lot of, okay? And if they don't have mortgage-backed securities, they got plenty of T-bills. And we heard the chair of the FDIC, like a week ago, say that there's $620 billion of unrealized losses, okay? The only thing that was unusual about SVB relative to other banks, okay, is that their deposits drew down more quickly. So because the tech ecosystem is, is more volatile, okay? Not because of irresponsibility, but because it's more of a, dependent on the boom-bust cycle. That's not got anything to do with the irresponsibility of any individual actor, okay? Their deposits went down and they got pressured first. But, the, but they would have been fine if interest rates hadn't spiked up as much as they have over the past year. That is the fundamental cause of that, okay? Mm -hmm. And wh who caused that problem? Washington. Washington caused that problem. The first couple of years, the Biden administration, we had unprecedented money printing and fiscal s stimulus, basically irresponsible spending that spiked inflation like we've never seen, that then caused Powell and the Fed to spike rates. And two days before SVB collapsed, you know what Powell was saying in front of Congress? He was saying, oh, I don't see any systemic problem in the banking system. These guys were completely asleep at the wheel, okay? This was a federal responsibility by regulators. It was a responsibility by Washington not to create this fiscal mess. Yes, SVB was worse than most. Those executives should lose all their stock options. Those stockholders should lose the value of their shares. But you're telling me that, oh, the depositors should lose out? It's their fault that they did this? So Come on, it, give me a break. You think it's a regulatory failure, basically. It's the, it's the Fed, it's, it's interest rates being kept too low for too long, or too much QE, too much free money, and then all of a sudden, whoops, inflation's back, and too many rate, rate heights too quickly. Is that roughly how you see it? Washington created this problem in numerous ways. Number one, they created the inflation. Number two, they then had to respond with these rapid interest rates, which Powell was blithely unaware were creating this huge stress in the banking system. A week ago, they knew that they had this problem of unrealized losses, and they didn't step in to do anything about it. And then last week, when they had the chance to nip this in the bud, either by placing SVB with a bigger bank, by basically backstopping the balance sheet, they could have done it before uh, this was even a big public issue, before like the populist element basically made this politically toxic. They didn't do that. On Friday, they could have stepped in and basically said that deposits are safe. They didn't do that. And now it's Sunday morning, and Yellen goes on the Sunday talk shows and gives this vague mealy mouth statement that is creating basically panic. Hmm. I'm just telling you, I know, listen, I, we work with hundreds of CEOs. You know, what, you know what they're all doing right now? They are all trying to figure out how to get their money out of whatever bank they're using into a top four bank because they're smart. They understand the dynamic that I told you about earlier. There is a two tier banking system. One tier, the too big to fail, your money is safe. The other tier, eh, who knows? They're like, why take a chance? I mean, by you saying that, are you not making it more likely? I mean, what, what do you think of people who, and a few of them are in the comments today, saying, Bill Ackman, yourself, people shouldn't go out there on the media saying there's going to be runs on the bank, all the smaller banks are going to have this crisis, we should all rush to big four banks, because that's just a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, but people are smart enough to figure this out without me saying it. 
I mean, the truth always comes out, Freddie. Is this true or not? That's the question you have to ask. If it's true, it's going to happen, whether Bill says it or I says it. I say it. So tell me what is wrong with this logic. I find the logic to be irrefutable. So um, I, I just think that this is the situation we're in, and the sooner you recognize it, the better off you're going to be. You're not going to stop. You're not going to stop this problem by burying your head in the sand like an ostrich. You're going to stop this problem by providing confidence in the regional banking system, ASAP. That is what the federal government needs to do right now. If they want there to be a regional banking system, backstop it, provide confidence. It's just and then take the actions, and then take the actions that are necessary, okay, once you've backstopped deposits, to go make sure that the balance sheets of all those banks are safe. By, by the way, how is it even conceivable that they knew that at the end of 2022, these banks were sitting on 620 billion of unrealized losses in just one bond category? And they're just like, yeah, we'll see what happens. Really? Hmm. Why wouldn't you mark those to market immediately? I guess the counter argument is more of a mood, which is that it's so depressing. We had 2008, we had that disaster. Probably millions of hours have been spent on making sure that the regulations have been changed since then to make sure that in a scenario like this, we don't have a panic. The whole idea is that not only in America, but across the world, banking regulations have been changed so that if a smaller bank had an issue like this, it would be able to fail gently in a way that wouldn't spook the whole wider economy. And what you're saying is actually, no, that's not possible. If any bank fails, it's, it's as big a, as a disaster as, as a big bank failing. And therefore, that whole idea that we could sort of adapt the risk profile was just for the birds. And we're back to where we always were. No, I mean, look, there's things we can do to shore up the banking system and make it more secure. But you have to realize you're dealing with systemic risks. All these banks are counterparties with each other. Their depositors have employees. They have to make payroll. They have customers. Um, and so on down the line. Mm -hmm. I know of one real estate guy, for example. He rents office space. It's not a tech business. His um, his uh, tenant had a letter of credit from SVB. Well, you know, the point of that letter of credit is to make sure that if the tenant goes under, then he's protected because he's got to make a, an interest payment. He's got his own bank payment to make to some other bank. Okay. Now, all of a sudden, that tenant goes under. He's, does he, is he backstopped? We don't even know. We're in like uncharted territory here. Like this, none of these things work when all of a sudden a letter of credit from a bank that's basically required by some other bank in order for the building owner to get his loan, all of a sudden you don't know if that's good paper or not. So we're just in the early stages of this cascade. That's just like one example. There's a million examples mm -hmm. like that. This is why you got to nip these things in the bud. And all these people are just like, this is an isolated problem. Um, they're just wrong. I mean, it's, it's systemic. But, but look, even if you believe I'm wrong, I mean, I believe I'm right. And, and just to be clear, like, we, we had some business dealings with SVB, but we got our money out. I mean, this is not, I'm not talking my book here, except that I, we do have portfolio companies who use SVB, and they need to get their money out. But, I, but like I said, I would be satisfied if they could just get their money out quickly. The, the question of whether you make depositors whole is sort of separate. Um, you could save Silicon Valley just by tonight announcing they'll get 85 cents on the dollar tomorrow and they'll be open for business, okay? So mm. to separate the issues. Um, but, um, okay. but, but, my, but my point is just this is not coming from me talking my book. I'm going to be just fine. This is about the integrity of the system. We have to be, I think, all very concerned right now that we're at the cusp of something really awful, um, which is basically a bank, a a, a uh, systemic issue in, in the banking system. How soon will we find out if that's happening or not? Well, let me put it this way. If, um, if the Fed were to do absolutely nothing, we would know on Monday because um, I already know that um, other banks are under pressure right now. I already know from my portfolio companies that they're planning on making wire requests, enormous wire requests on Monday to move their money out. It is basically... Everyone's deposits, which are supposed to be completely safe, have now become hot money, and they're all trying to figure out where it's going to go, and they're literally moving it around day by day to try and avoid where they think the next bank run could occur. So we will okay. see evidence of that. If, 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 if not enough happens today or this evening, I yeah. think we'll already see evidence of that in the morning. and that We'll, we'll see stress. We'll see stress. I don't know if it's going to go under. What, what I've heard... Um, you know, is that um, is that the Fed is working with those banks right now to try and shore them up, that it is providing liquidity and it may be backstopping them even. So, it, so I think the Fed is doing things behind the scenes. 
I don't know why you wouldn't just announce it publicly what you're doing because it would create a lot more confidence. So for example, if you know Bank X is backstopped by the Fed, there's no reason to try taking your money out. But when you do it secretly, what happens is that people are still going to take their money out. Now that bank could be crippled because it's lost all of its deposits. Okay, they're backed up by the Fed, but you haven't solved the underlying problem. So, um, so I no, think that are there no like private actors that should be getting involved? I've heard that there are big private equity groups that are talking about kind of rescue funds and multi-billion um, gestures they can make to try and um, help out. Obviously, the idea that someone might buy the bank and rescue it, as I mentioned at the introduction, Elon Musk, as usual, has been named as the sort of a savior. He's going to come in. Do you not think there's any hope of, in that direction? And maybe that's why the Fed is trying to keep a bit quieter, so that it doesn't. It's not just the Fed and no, nobody else. Well, here, here's the crazy thing: is that in 2008, Jamie Dimon stepped up to be that good guy and be the white knight and bail out WAMU and and bail out Bear, Bear Stearns. And you know what the federal government did? They charged him tens of billions of dollars of penalties and fines in subsequent litigation for doing that. And he gave interviews a number of years ago saying that you know. Uh, no good deed goes unpunished. We never should have done that. So, you know, the federal government here doesn't have a great history. And, uh, you know, and I think that uh, you, you, I think that very easily they could have placed SVB with a top bank, but they would have to basically make certain guarantees to facilitate that, to kind of grease the wheels. And, um, and they certainly didn't do that. Um, so this is the problem that we're in. And, and like I said, the longer you wait, the, the harder it is to fix this problem. Okay, I've got, um, I've got one slightly technical yeah. question that's come in from Glenn Wallace that I'm going to shoot at you. Um, the two big to fail banks are the ones subject to bail in rules, according to Title II of Dodd Frank. So, wouldn't deposits be, in a way, less safe in the big banks? It's a kind of counterintuitive idea that I confess I hadn't thought of. Um, what's I don't understand there? what that. I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, this, this, I can read it out, or we'll just move yeah. on. It's I don't. Yeah, you're getting kind of technical. Listen, the, the, the reason what I can tell you right now is that the conversations that are happening among founders all over Silicon Valley is that I'm moving my money to a big four bank. Right. That and 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 whether you, whether you think that is an overreaction or not, whether you think that is unnecessary, because all the banks they're in are perfectly solvent, it's all going to be fine. It doesn't matter because now it's like a psychosocial phenomenon where. If you know that everybody else is thinking this way, then you have to think this way. Hmm. It's this is not, it's not about solvency anymore. It's about confidence. The Fed must provide confidence in the banking system immediately. Do you want to see? I mean, we talked about the politics a little bit at the start there, and you self-described as a libertarian. I think. Are you comfortable with this as a as a political direction? Then you you don't feel you don't have anxiety about this if if what you've called for happens. And there's a blanket support of all banks. Does any part of you feel a little bit anxious that this is going to be moving in a political direction that you don't like? Yeah, I mean, look. So I, I wouldn't self-identify as a libertarian. What I would say is I understand libertarianism and I'm influenced by it. I understand the power of markets, and I think it's better to let markets decide where that's possible. And I also understand moral hazard problems and want to avoid them. So I get all of that. Okay. Um, I also believe, based on history, American history, that the, the private market by itself cannot solve the problem of bank runs. Again, it just comes back to it's, it's the game theory. It's too rational for people to pull their money out of a bank that maybe they hear is questionable. Maybe it has a problem because there's no penalty for doing that and they might save all their money. And we, so we've seen the history of this. And so... FDIC was created for a good reason. That was smart. You know, there are there are issues in the economy, like with monopolies, where you you can't just have a perfectly um, I don't even want to call it a free market, but you need the government to basically um, create the conditions for the free market to succeed. Okay, just like the government creates property rights. Okay, uh, we it provides the basis for contracts. Someone violates a contract, you can go into court. This idea that uh, the government that any government action is basically inimical to the free market doesn't make any sense. Setting up the, the right preconditions by the government is necessary for the free market to blossom. And basically providing confidence in the banking system by preventing bank runs is one of those very fundamental federal responsibilities. 
So that's how I see it. Now, in terms of um, the moral hazard problem here, um, we would not have needed to make a, 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 let's call it a regional bank guarantee three days ago, four days ago. This thing could have been solved quietly very easily. If the, if the Fed had come in, uh, they should never have let SVB file for receivership, or actually they didn't. It was the California regulator who stepped in on Friday. They should have solved this problem on Wednesday or Thursday. It was clear. All the sharks on Wall Street were smelling blood in the water. It's why SVB stock was tanking before Friday. Why didn't the Fed step in then and fix this? Even on Friday, I think they could have solved the problem by saying, we understand the situation. We're going to backstop the depositors. The, there'll be no bailout of the shareholders. They're done, but the depositors don't have to. And so it would have been easier. They wouldn't have had to make this blanket statement. Every day this goes on, they have to make a more sweeping announcement to solve the problem. So, Freddie, I guess the question is, could they get by with something less than a blanket guarantee? I just don't know. I mean, maybe they could. But again, you have to think about upside, downside. Uh, what you want to do at every stage of a running panic like this is you want to come in as early as, problem, as possible and hit the problem with a sledgehammer. You want to do a bear hug, okay? You solve it immediately. You overreact because if you underreact, it keeps growing and gaining steam, and then it becomes harder to solve. So listen, is there some less than approach here? Maybe. I don't know. Let someone else come up with that. Um, but I, but I'm, what I'm saying is one way or another, they need to get this job done. David Sachs. Thank you so much. Good to be with you. Thank you, David. Um, we will find out pretty soon, I guess, <laughs> who is right and who is